and welcome to the latest episode of the Online Warriors podcast, the podcast where three friends ask the question, do you sort your laundry into like different colors? On this episode, we're going to talk about that for at least five minutes because I'm a legal 86. I'm one of your hosts and I do not sort my laundry into, into different colors. I just throw my laundry at the washing machine with reckless abandon and whatever sticks gets washed. That's my system. One of our other hosts, Nerd Bomber, has a multi-tiered, like color-coded. How long does it take you to do your laundry end to end? Let's let's start there because I feel like yeah, it's how long take does you it longer. take you to do your laundry? So Tactic has been doing the laundry for the last couple of years. The I last. was the primary <laughs> laundry person when we lived in apartments before we moved into the house. But my tier system is essentially dress clothes are all one separate load. Those get cold water on the the wash cycle, and then those don't even get dried. Those get hung dried. The rest, you have different color segments. You have your dark, so you have your blues, your black shirts, your gray shirts, all that kind of stuff. Purple, that's all one load. Then you have like your bright colors that pop, your reds, orange, yellow shirts, all that kind of good stuff. That's another load. And then your white shirts and your white laundry, like socks, underwear, anything you want to keep white, that crisp white. And then if you're really feeling, you know, really sorty, You can definitely even separate out your pants, like sweatpants and jeans and shorts can go in a different load and hoodies, like the thick fabric, because you know those need a bigger dry cycle. But yeah, and then... You're missing one more bin. Towels, linens, and sheets. Oh yeah, towels, linens, and sheets. But those aren't like clothes that you wear regularly. Like that's their own little thing. Like you're not sorting those. I don't think you're throwing that in with your t-shirts. Yeah, but you have to do the extended dry cycle. That's why those get thrown. Right, but I'm just saying, like that's not clothes. You're never going to throw those in with clothes anyway. So, but you're, but you're not. So I, I need to clarify that. So you're not using hot water at all. No, I do. Whites get hot water. Do whites get... Oh, that's what I was getting at. Do, do white... Because, like, thing I is, know... Thing is that can shrink. So, like, typically the whites that we wear are, like, undershirts or, like, most of my whites that I do care about, those are dress shirts. So... Right. I don't... Like, I don't worry. Those get hung dry either way. So, I hang dry sweaters because sweaters will will shrink if you blow on them, basically. So, I have to do that. I don't use any hot water at all. Mrs. Legal 86, and I'm referring to my mom, Not uh, I'm not married yet. She had a system where I believe she did white separately and uh, with hot water. But I think, I, I you know, look, college is a formative experience. Uh, you go to college and you have to do laundry for the first time when your mom has been doing your laundry for 18 years. Guess what you do? You just throw everything at the washer and see what sticks. And clearly that has... that methodology has stuck with me but that burned me like i got pink clothing when i accidentally put a fresh red and like here's the thing too sometimes you can throw reds and stuff in with other colors obviously never white but the first time you wash a red shirt that is gonna bleed you're gonna get red everywhere i thought that only happened with because i look i bought red shirts I'm not a monochromatic, like I'm not wearing all grays, you know, I've bought red shirts and I've washed them with other things. And like the world has not ended. I, I always thought that was more of a hot water thing. If you use hot water, the colors bleed. So I figure, all right, I'm just going to wash things with cold water. It's more of a of function life. of how old the red shirt is. So like, for example, Tectic and I are actually both wearing brand new red shirts and those went through the wash with other reds because the first time that you have a shirt and you run it through the wash, it is going to bleed. After like the second or third wash, you don't really have to worry about it that much. But I still like to be cautious because, you know, what, See, but, what, yeah. does that ever hurt anybody to be cautious? I don't think so. It, well, it's it's hurt. It's hurt my joy and my time. Like, like, so I've bought new red shirts, but I will say one thing that might be the X factor for me when I go clothes shopping, which admittedly is seldom. I go to when I go to like Kohl's, for example, shout out to Kohl's. I've shopped there. When I see a shirt that says Easy Care on it, that's Easy Street for me. And I I angle towards the Easy Care because I don't like ironing. I, we don't I, own an ironing board. I don't know if I've ever ironed anything as a functioning adult. Like I know I did when I lived with my parents, but since I've been on my own, I have not ironed a single piece of clothing, period. I've ironed things, but every time I'm ironing something, I'm like... Oh my god, people do this regularly. Like like I do it like like I feel like every year at Christmas time, I wear I like I'm like I'm going to wear a nice shirt and I'm not just going to wear it, I'm going to iron it. I'm going to look my level best and like halfway through ironing, I'm like it's close enough. 
because it's an arduous process. But like my point is, I think easy care, it, it, it's, it's wrinkle free, but I think it might also be like, hey, we know you're just some punk who do- doesn't know how to do laundry. And the care with this shirt is easy and you have to take no care. You can just throw it into the, into the washing machine. Maybe I've been, maybe I've just been blessed. Maybe the laundry gods have smiled down upon me and that's why I've never had any bleeding, whatever, but I've never had a major mishap besides like the dryer catching things occasionally, which that's just part of being alive. We're not going to talk about laundry this entire podcast. That would be a great segment, but we're going to kind of put that on the back burner for a secret segment or I don't know some other time because we have news to to talk about uh this week we're gonna be talking about enola holmes in particular the announcement of a sequel which i think we've all seen that i know at least nerd bomber brought it up in a what are you up to i know i've watched it since then Mm -hmm. so we're gonna be talking about that we're gonna be talking about this big uh, warner media discovery deal and we're also gonna be talking about starfield you guys remember Starfield. It's a game that's been kind of in the whisperings of the video game community for quite a while. There was a trailer, I believe, back in 2018. Well, it sounds like it is actually coming very, very soon. We're talking 2022, but there is a catch. So we're going to get into all of that. I think we should start with Starfield because, you know, we have the resident space RPG lady here in residence as usual. That's and a actually, fact. I, woot, woot. I assume you're going to talk about that later. I don't want to spoil your No, you. my shipment got delayed. It hasn't even come yet. I almost heard the sound of your wound being opened (laughs) by me from across the vast reaches of cyberspace. So, well, nonetheless, you're a Mass Effect fan. You're a space RPG fan. Presumably Starfield is on your to-do list. Uh, This is a game from Bethesda. It's, again, been been kind of in the hopper for for many years. We got a trailer in, in June of 2018. Of course, Bethesda being the creator of Skyrim, there's a lot of hype surrounding this. It's a game that director Todd Howard says he's wanted to make for a very long time. Well, you know, we've gotten calls for patience. We've gotten the acquisition of Bethesda by Microsoft. And now we have a situation where Starfield is going to be exclusive to Xbox and PC. So we have a couple of console... I don't, I don't want to call myself a PlayStation fanboy. And I don't want to call you guys Xbox fanboys. But uh, you guys have both consoles. I only have a PlayStation. I don't know for sure that Starfield is even a game that I would be privy to, given that I didn't really play through Skyrim. I'm going to talk about my Horizon Zero Dawn experience later, but w- what's your takeaway here? I mean, this is this is a flagship, or it's, it's planned to be a flagship title for Bethesda. This is a huge money move for Xbox. Presumably, it's why they made the deal with Bethesda in the first place. So, so I think this is exactly why Microsoft acquired Bethesda. I mean, like you said, this is a moneymaker. This is a flagship property here. I think this could become a huge IP. I mean, you look at how big other Bethesda RPGs have become. Your Skyrims, your Fallouts, and they are massive franchises that not only had a big initial offering, but then stood the test of time and had numerous sequels that still have a rabid fan base around them. Right. And I think one of the keys here is we've obviously seen that Microsoft is putting a lot of stock into Game Pass. Game Pass is really kind of like the focal point of this next generation for them. And one of the ways to make Game Pass successful is to have games come to the service day one. I mean, we saw what happened when MLB The Show launched on Game Pass That was a huge hubbub, a big deal for a lot of people, a game that people normally flock to PlayStation for. People are playing it on Xbox. And I think if you have these massive offerings, these exclusive deals, again, I I feel like we've talked about this in the past. I don't even know if Xbox cares if you buy the Series X. Like, they really don't care at this point. Because the game will be available on PC. It'll be available on the cloud gaming service. All they want to do is get you in that Game Pass ecosystem, and this is a great way to do it. Like, I've been waiting for that big title to hit Game Pass day one that makes the entire subscription even more worth it than it already is. And this is part of the reason why I bought a Series X, or rather, Tectic helped me buy a Series X, because... Man, you're really talking me up this episode. Way to, hey, way to go, Tectic. Hey, this guy, you know, kudos to him, woke up at Laundry, like five in the Xbox. morning. <laughs> refreshed like a madman to secure a console after i had ladies, hunted for ladies i'm taken and then he did a fresh load of laundry 
<laughs> what a man. But like this is this is the type of game that will move consoles because especially coming off the heels of the news, I think it was last week that Sony announced they have 25 games in the works. Half of those are new IPs. We saw what kind of pull that had for the PlayStation 4 generation. I mean, the uh, incredible new games and IPs that they were putting out for the last generation drove a ton of sales and made the PlayStation 4 one of the biggest consoles of all time. So I think right. Xbox has finally seen, hey, we need to compete with this if we want to keep people on this service and get people in the door and into the Xbox ecosystem. And so for a lot of people who are sad that Bethesda games may not be going to the PlayStation 5, I totally get it. It's a bummer. This game looks awesome from the very, very little we know about it. I mean, basically, you say the word space RPG, and I am excite. So that is sad that people who don't have an Xbox may not get to play it, but there's other ways to play it, you know, like the cloud system. You can subscribe to that, play it on your phone if you want to, if that's possible. But I think this was important for Microsoft to kind of put their foot down and carve out a space for exclusive games, because that's been something that's been lacking in their offering for a while. Well, so my, you know, again, not not being at all in that ecosystem, I agree with you that their plan, you know, when they made this acquisition and, and you know, it was always we're going to get all we need to do is get people's foot in the door, so to speak. And they're certainly bound to do that with a huge title like Starfield. One of my main questions and a, and a leading question, admittedly, that I don't have the answer to is, you know, PlayStation, ever since the Bethesda deal was announced, they know this is coming right? Sony knows this is coming. Mm -hmm. These 25 games you mentioned, half of them being new IPs, I would imagine, I don't know the details on any of them, but I would imagine that somewhere in there is a quote-unquote answer to this. You know, whether whether it's a space RPG. Let me look RPG, at Returnal. Returnal's not a space RPG necessarily. It's a little no. different. It's got the roguelite thing. But yeah, I, I, there's going to be some answer in there. Uh, and it might not, it might not even be a new IP. Probably would be, but you know, d dare I hope for a Dead Space remaster? Like, there could be plenty of things that PlayStation could do, is, is my point, that I would be like, oh, okay, well, you know, Xbox threw the gauntlet and PlayStation, I don't know, did whatever it is you do after someone throws a gauntlet. Do you just throw your gauntlet on top of their gauntlet? What's gauntlet etiquette? Mega gauntlet. I'm, I'm guessing PlayStation has an answer, is is my point. They'd have but, to. Statistically, they'd have to. Right. Who knows what it is, but it's. I think it's out there. The thing here, too, so exclusivity sucks in my opinion it really does but at the same time it may be the driving force where we'll get to see all of these really cool new games and ips because now there is a like a competition here last generation playstation probably could have stopped making new ips you know what i mean yeah. no, doubt, no doubt the ones that they already had probably would have pushed them forward because Microsoft was really not pumping out many exclusive titles. A lot of them were third-party games that could be played anywhere. And so maybe we wouldn't have gotten a Spider-Man, you know? Now there's this competition where they're going to have to try to one-up each other. And so, yeah, it sucks because not everybody can afford to spend a grand on two gaming consoles. I mean, it's just realistically, most people might struggle to spend five hundred dollars on one console and they'll have I to mean, wait yeah. for her a few I years haven't, i haven't bought either of them yet i don't know when i will right um, but it's like down the line we're ultimately getting more ips more creative games hopefully more innovation in games as now they try to compete with each other through exclusives so while it does suck to be on the outside looking in it also paves the way for potentially a new golden age in gaming yeah you have to wonder for you know how many episodes of the podcast did we spend talking about like on the verge of the new console generation a lot of what we talked about right was okay hardware this hardware that this console has this this console has that it's interesting in a sense how it's not at all about that anymore it, it, it hasn't been for a little bit now it's been i mean for microsoft it's been about game pass but i think in general like you said it's been more about okay we need to, we need to gather exclusives we need to gather games because that's what's going to bring people at this point. The hardware isn't going to do it anymore. Because, first of all, the difference differences in the hardware are much more minimal in this day and age. But second of all, it's just it's just less likely to put asses in the seats, so to speak. People are going to look at the games and decide which console has better games, and that's how they're going to choose. So exclusives are super important. And at this point, I have I I'll still get a PlayStation just because 
I have a much stronger sense of what I'm getting from them. I've also never been a big Bethesda person, never been a big RPG person. So yeah, you don't like dialogue. Have a lot of draw. Yeah, I don't like dialogue. So that doesn't have a lot of draw for me. Whereas Sony has various tried and true franchises that sit exactly in the illegal eighty six niche of like a lot games. more like action adventure, very big cinematic games. Yeah, it, it it has the trappings of story, but it's not, and and it you know it has skill trees and inventories and things like that, but it's not arduous. You know, it's it's I, I shouldn't frame Bethesda's games or the upcoming Starfield game as arduous. I'm sure a lot of people just just log onto Twitter to type me an angry message. I look forward to seeing them, but yeah, I think PlayStation is going to be the one for me. But but Starfield, I mean, it has so much promise, right? I think like. Another recent example you could take with Starfield is I know Destiny is still going on. Destiny had a great thing going and then they put their foot in it. That's at least my understanding based on people I know who were very, very, we both, we have a mutual friend, Firestorm501. I think he actually, he was on the podcast or maybe the old version of the podcast. He was lost in that game. Like when Destiny 1 came out, it was like his life. Shout out to Firestorm501. It was his life destiny 2 and I, i've played both and destiny 2 wasn't as good and look i know starfield's not going to be the same by any measure it's not going to be as shooter driven it's not going to be as raid driven maybe but they had a great thing going they had an ecosystem they had a huge following and there's an open door now for that kind of game i think so starfield is poised to walk through it and xbox is poised to benefit from it so we will and I'm see poised to have a lot of fun on both of my consoles and love it yeah the the golden age of gaming i think i think that's what you said so it, it's it's coming if it if it's not already here for people we want to know what you think are you excited for starfield are you excited for any of playstation's 25 announced games they have in the hopper anything specific anything not specific do you dislike my opinions because that often happens uh hit yes. us up on twitter just kidding i wasn't talking to you i was talking to the listeners but it's good to know i'll put that in the suggestion box and for those, we should have a video version of the podcast. You'd be able to see me throwing something into a garbage can right now. It's a classic joke. This is a <laughs> suggestion box garbage can joke. Hit us up on Twitter. At OW, the 86 is my handle. At OW, Nerd Bomber. At OW, Tactic. And of course, our main show account, at Online Warriors 1. For any of the stuff about Bethesda, Starfield, the PlayStation games, or anything we talk about in the episode today, because there's more to get to. Let's move into, let's, I'll hop on a train. Let's go to Tactic Town. All right. You know who the mayor of Tactic Town is? Is it, is it me? No, it's me. You're the comptroller, actually. Does anyone know what a comptroller does? Let's farm that out to Twitter as well. Tell me what a comptroller does. No, Tactic, you're the mayor. Come on, it's Tactic Town. We're taking ourselves to Tactic Town because we need to talk about portfolios, specifically diversification of one's portfolio. That might as well be the motto of, of Tactic Town. Do towns have mottos? I'll stop asking questions like that, but... I think we they have talk slogans. About- Oh, slogan. That's the word I was looking for. I don't think we're going to really talk about diversification of portfolios. I think it's a totally different animal that we're about to talk about. Mergers. It, it's, it's, right. It's kind, of, it's kind of the opposite, right? It mergers and acquisitions or just mergers. Yeah, it's just a merger. It's not an acquisition. Warner Media and Discovery is what we're talking about. So uh, Warner Media, of course, being the owners of, among many other things, HBO Max. Discovery being kind of a cable giant. Uh, you know, TLC, Food Network, Investigation Discovery, HGTV, and of course, Discovery itself. These are Discovery properties. They're joining forces. $43 billion deal with hopes of kind of taking on Netflix, Hulu, Disney Plus, those giants. I I should say, I should start by saying, functionally, if you are an HBO Max user, if you are a Discovery Plus user, uh, in this household, we use both. It seems like what I'm reading from this is that not much about your life will change and not much about the lives of the of either in the short will change in the short term so no need to be fearful guy fieri is not going to be kicking down the hbo max door with his diners drive-ins and dives quite yet. he's going to be the next justice league member batman superman guy fieri his Actually, that would tips. be funny bam man G- give him fire powers just give him fire powers his frosted tips will look like flames anyway i don't want to derail this too much but we were on a cruise way back when back in the day and there was a guy fieri burger stand probably the best hamburgers i've ever had in my life so like guy knows what he's doing he so doesn't mess around if you call him guy fieri to his face he actually like he'll say something to you i've seen it done 
it's he's very he's very delicate about his name guy fietti you gotta you gotta give it the old the old flair sorry no i it's, can't it's, i can't do we, we all know at this point i can't pronounce people's names that's just i will go down in history as the person who sucks at pronouncing names i'll just say hey guy and i'll be like you know my name and he'll be like of course i do i love you so okay i want to say i want to say first to you before we get into the businessy stuff hbo max is like the worst app ever i am currently going through game of thrones as i've mentioned i watch a number of things on hbo max also watch the west wing on hbo max pretty regularly that app holy crap uh and i think we've talked about this on the show before i think just how bad that app is but i don't know if that's your guys experience as well but it's like next level bad to me i mean i don't find it that difficult to navigate i've never really had that big of a problem finding something and then once I'm in a show, I'm okay, but they don't, I think my biggest issue is they don't do a good job of highlighting new things, which I think that might be done purposefully because there's such a big back library of old things that they have on their service. I'm, I'm talking from a fundamental, like, I see a thing I want to watch. Let me play it. That is hard. Oh, oh yeah. see, I just, I hit the play button and it plays. So over Christmas, we went to watch Wonder Woman 1984 and that was granted that was like in the early goings of HBO Max but it would not play on the smart TV at my parents house and like we oh, had to I go through Oh I do remember through, that. We had we had to like jump through a bunch of hoops. I had to play it through my phone th- using like AirPlay or something. Just this past weekend I went to watch The West Wing and I had to restart my entire Fire Stick because HBO Max refused to play anything even after I like cleared the data and the cache from the app. Do you know what solved this problem? Having a Roku. Is that where you're yeah. going? Yeah. Yeah. I do have a Roku. But my entire ecosystem lives on on a Fire Stick that's actually plugged into a Roku TV. So just back out and use the Roku TV for HBO. I don't want to. <laughs> I I love Jeff Bezos just too much to do that. But this isn't. We're not. I don't want to poke holes in the apps. My girlfriend watches Discovery Plus all the time. It seems great. I've never really used it much myself, but it has they got a lot of stuff on there. So, Tactic, let's go to you for some talk on the portfolio. I mean, this is like you said, this is a merger. This is anti diversification of the. What would what's the term you would use? Is it just a, is merger the term? Or? I would just use the word merger. So, I mean, there is anti diversification going on here though, because AT and T was trying to diversify their portfolio with a media conglomerate, and then that didn't work out. So now they're selling it. And now we're undiversifying because it's now two TV companies together. Yeah, I, I'd say undiversifying, but really strengthening what's good in their current portfolio. I think they're sort of staying in their house and what works and only just like strengthening it and building it up on a better foundation. One of the uh, quotes that was used that I really kind of honed in on was, you can have King Shark from DC host Shark Week. And it's it's things like that that I, that as you as you put it so elegantly before puts asses in the seats. It's this sort of fun spin that they can do with a lot of things and strengthen everything and and really push it to the next level. And even combined services, like you said, things aren't changing now, but one day they might. They're they're probably going to optimize it to be this beefy service that can now compete with your Disney Plus and and your Netflix. Right, because well, it's about volume in a sense, right? And if you look at the subscriber bases of Netflix and Disney Plus, you know they they both have their advantages. Netflix, of course, was kind of the first person, the first company to do this, right? So people have never left them. They were the first people. They got everybody, and they never, no one's ever left. Companies are looking for ways to create these merger opportunities, such that they then have that same subscriber base by combining the subscriber base with the two smaller apps and making one bigger app that houses everything eventually they'll be on the same playing field is is i think i think that's the business strategy generally you know i i am not sure to what extent that will work and also when that will happen like you said in the short term the two apps are going to remain the same but i would assume they will eventually become one big app and of course we're getting closer and closer to just having cable again but I, what One thing I was thinking about is to what extent, if any, did putting out new movies both in theaters and on HBO Max, the simultaneous release, to what extent does that play into this? You know, I think did, it might have been a pretty big impetus for AT&T to look into selling because I think they ended up losing a decent amount of money. I don't remember what movie it was, but one of the movies, I think it maybe it was the Snyder Cut, so it wasn't going to be a theatrical release, but I think the the numbers came out and the subscriber base didn't really increase all that much and not as much as they 
surely anticipated it would by releasing that movie. And so I can't imagine right. they're being super pleased by the subscriber increase. And let's be real, some of the movies, like there have been big hitters like Godzilla vs. Kong and Mortal Kombat, but the smaller titles, uh, I'm struggling with the names, but the one that Angelina Jolie just put out that premiered yeah, over the weekend. Those, those Who Wish Me Dead, I believe is what it's called. Right. And the one with the, detec- Malik. Right, the yeah. detective movie. That the I Little can't Things. Re- the Little Things. Thank you. I'm struggling with the names here. But I feel like those aren't enough, sadly, to draw people in to subscribe to the service because we're getting kind of movies of that caliber in some instances on Netflix. And I think yeah. one of the things that struck me was that Warner Media and Discovery combined currently spend about $20 billion a year on new content, which is more than Netflix, which I think was aiming to spend about $17 billion this year. So... I think by kind of combining forces, that makes their investments a little bit more effective if they can kind of produce this one single, almost conglomerated service that more people might get their eyes on. Yeah, I I think that's probably exactly right. You know, I I don't know to what extent we already use both apps in this household. So like they're not going to gain anything from us that they don't already have. But I do wonder what the market share is what percentage of people only have one app who would like to have both or things like that where like how do they expect this move to help them gain money from you know joe the plumber for the average joe i do not know i don't understand streaming economics like is the point i'm trying to make i guess but seems like as good a move as any when netflix is still out there breaking necks and cashing checks left and right i think the other interesting part of this is that there's also a lot of nuance that you don't really think about like what's happening with DC Comics, what's happening with Warner Brothers Interactive. And I mean, we're talking about NetherRealm and TT Games, who does a lot of those Lego games. And I think Rocksteady, you know, what what's happening with all of those studios? Tactic, do you know anything about that? I do uh, believe that they might look to sort of spread out the gaming offshoots into their own divestments than and other companies that might be interested in them. And then I think they're going to focus more on the, the cable and streaming side of it. Yeah, but I want a guy's grocery games, the game. I mean, who doesn't want that? I don't even like Guy Fieri and I want that. Have you guys ever watched Guy's Grocery Games? I have, yeah, actually. It's awesome. I feel bad saying this. I like that better than Supermarket Sweep. Oh, yeah, that's just wrong. Yeah, you touched a nerve. I, I was, I'm sorry, I do. There's would, more There's more talent required in guys' grocery games. That's what makes it worse. Supermarket Sweep is just a bunch of morons. <laughs> a bunch of knuckleheads running around in a supermarket not knowing where stuff is. I, I, I want to see, if I show up to a game show, I want to see gross incompetence. I don't want to see, I don't want to see chefs that are doing things I could never do. I want to shout at the TV and say, the tide is over there. Yeah, but they're doing idiot. stuff with, with crazy ingredients. And then you go, holy kielbasa, I have that in my cupboard. If I want that, I'll watch Chopped. And granted, Chopped does kind of deal with some like, they're like, oh, in this in this container, you have, you know, peanut butter crunch and duck intestines. And you can't get duck intestines in a grocery store, right? But I don't know. Guys, grocery games is fine. That, the point I was trying to make is it's a good show. It's better than Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Dr- Diners, Drive-Ins, and Drive-Ins, and Dives. First of all, I can't even say the name. And second of all, all it is is Guy Fieri taking a big juicy bite out of some sandwich and going, oh my God, it's so good. And that's it. That's the whole show. Why would I show up for that? Why I know you? what food is. I know food is good. I, I don't know. Tell me otherwise. I don't know what to tell you. I'm not going to argue with him. He's, he's the band master. He's, he, he, he's, he's not the point of this. Well, there's another point that I do want to talk about. And in the interview, it basically alluded to the fact that they're going to be investing a lot more into the DC Comics side of it and bolstering that division. And there is multiple mentions of Batman and Superman, Batman and Superman. So they're they're looking heavily, the new CEO is looking heavily to really leverage that universe and leverage that IP to push it further than it's ever been before. So that's another thing that to be excited I mean, about. Batman, very on board. Superman, it's a stupid superhero. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm busting shops out here today. I don't know. I think, though, there are a lot of DC superheroes, even outside of Batman and Superman. Like, those are your tent poles. So that's what's going to get people in the door and establish kind of like your... What they tried to do with the DC Extended Universe and it kind of all crumbled apart. But, like, those are your yeah. tent poles and you establish those guys and it brings people in the doors... 
as you guys have been saying all episode, puts asses in seats, then you can introduce some of these more tertiary characters and then really start to flesh out the universe. I mean, I think it's good that they're focusing on it. I feel like the focus yeah. on DC property has wavered a lot. And I don't know what the right solution to the DC problem is. I almost wonder if you just lean into like the television aspect and like the streaming stuff, you know, like that's been pretty successful. I don't know if you can compete with the MCU in theaters enough, but maybe. I mean, DC has uh, has struggled a lot because they have tried to reach what M- the MCU has reached without doing the work. And I'm not saying they should just look at MCU and do what the MCU is doing, but they should also be able to look at the MCU and realize like, yeah, these properties are worth a good amount of money. Like you said, they're the highest potential. They have the highest potential in terms of making them money down the stretch. So it would make perfect sense for them to say, yeah, Batman and Superman these are our guys if only for like you said creating a gateway to other other characters so warner media discovery what do they call it hbo discovery discovery max discovery max plus hbo max hbo plus discovery discover max. hbo although then it just sounds like you're trying no. to get people to find out discovery more about hbo plus max i like hbo plus discovery max because it's it, the plus the plus makes it like you're adding two things together we'll see what they come up with it's going to be it's going to be none of those things but time will tell. We are going to be taking a short break to shout out one of our sponsors. But before we do, we would be remiss if we did not shout out our fantastic Patreon producers, Mr. Ben Checkness, Mr. Stephen Keller. Both of you have guest spots coming up on the show, wink, wink. And that is a direct result of your subscribership to our Patreon. In particular, Ben and Stephen are subscribers at the night level, which is the highest of our three levels on Patreon. As a result, they get access to the monthly secret segment and vlog, of course, but they also get this occasional guest spot for the time being. They also get input into our weekly game segment and this producer shout out itself. So shout out to Ben and Steven. Thanks to you guys so much for your continued support. We also have a Squire level, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment and vlog. And of course, the lowly page level, which gets you access to the monthly secret segment. So for more of the details on that, you can head over to patreon.com slash online warriors podcast. Check things out there. Thanks again to Ben and Steven. We're going to take a short break and we will be coming back to talk about Enola Holmes. Do you experience digital eye strain from too much blue light exposure from digital screens? Baxter blue glasses are not your average frames. These blue light lenses filter 80% of the highest energy blue light, eliminating 99% of glare. The past year, we have all been glued to our devices more than ever. When I'm making tinkering videos, I have long nights staring at my computer screen. Whether I'm staring at code or editing software, the blue light can really be a drain on the eyes. Blue light glasses can be a real game changer. Our exposure to digital light has soared, and our eyes and our sleep are suffering as a result. Baxter Blue is also a force for good and provides a pair of reading glasses for someone in need for every pair sold. This is eyewear built for our digital age, and Baxter Blue is giving our listeners 10% off your next purchase of blue light, sleep, or kids' glasses. Click the link in our show notes for your exclusive discount. This is the sign you have been waiting for to invest in blue light glasses. We know you will love your Baxters, and we know that you will feel the difference. Thanks again to Baxter Blue for sponsoring this episode, and now back to the show. Okay, Enola Holmes. Uh, Particularly Enola Holmes 2, we're going to be talking about now. So, as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, I, Legal 86, Nerd Bomber, and I believe Technic... I mean, you guys lived together. You had to have watched the movie together. We did. Uh, we've, we've all seen it. We've all seen Enola Holmes 1. If you haven't seen it, you should go watch it right now. It's it was pretty good. Yeah. Enola, of course, is, is alone backwards. I think that plays into the first movie in some way. I don't remember exactly how. I think it's a minor detail. But this is uh, Millie Bobby Brown playing the t- titular character, Henry Cavill as Sherlock Holmes, and they will both be back to reprise their roles in addition to the director, Harry Bradbeer, and the writer, Jack Thorne. I'm pretty excited about this. You know, Enola Holmes was, look, we've talked so many times on this show in our, in our, what we've been up to section of like, ah, oh, watch this movie on Netflix. It was, yeah, you know, that's what often happens. Enola Holmes was decidedly not, yeah, it wasn't like the greatest Oscar winning thing in the world, but it was very fun. It was very cute. It was very well thought out. It was well plotted. 
I had a good time watching it, and I'm a huge sucker for Sherlock Holmes. And even though this involves Sherlock Holmes in kind of a tertiary way, Enola Holmes makes frequent use of his methodologies, right? That's kind of the whole shtick. So I'm big into this news. Enola Holmes, for those that don't know, based on a book series called Enola Holmes Mysteries, uh, telling the stories of Sherlock Holmes' rebellious teen sister, who is a gifted super sleuth in her own right, and often outsmarts her famous siblings. Nominated for multiple Edgar Awards, haven't ever read the books. I I don't think I, sh- I should read them now or would read them now, but I'll sure as heck watch the movie. So yeah, I, I think we're going to be generally in agreement on this, but I'll swing it around the table for some thoughts. Nerd Bomber, Enola Holmes 2, yes or no? Is it elementary, dear Watson, or is it I don't know, whatever the opposite of elementary is. I mean, I would definitely watch this. I really enjoyed the first movie. I thought it was super fun. And especially in the time when it came out, I feel like we were getting a lot of serious movies. And especially with what was going on in the world, it was a breath of fresh air. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. And I feel like this is the type of stuff that I'm looking for out of Netflix movies. I feel like we've gotten a lot of like action movies and stuff like that. And yeah, there was some action in Enola Holmes, but having like a feel good fun movie that had a few laughs here and there that you didn't feel like you didn't walk away feeling heavy after watching it or anything like that. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was good. And I'm super excited. Also super excited because Millie Bobby Brown, I think is producer on the series as well. And I think that's really cool because it, she was what 16 when the first movie came out and to have both an actor and a producer that young at the helm is something that you don't see a lot of. And I think that's really cool. So I want to talk about narratively what we might expect. So at the end of the last movie, there's a couple of loose threads. So if you are if you haven't seen Enola Holmes, I don't know, turn your volume down for a couple minutes. Do you think we see more of Helena Bonham Carter? And also, do you think we see more of the Tewksbury guy? I so the Mar- is, it, is it the Marquess of Tewksbury? I believe I so, yeah. Something like that. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned these these other characters because I want to circle back to really what the first one was about. In the in the first one, she was super, super dependent on her and her mother being a duo. Like that was her whole being. And and her being off on this adventure was really her finding herself and gaining her own independence. And okay. while these characters were good complementary characters. To her, I think, I don't want to expect that we'll see them, but rather they'll be kind of these come and go characters through the thing, because I, I want her to continue to develop as this strong, independent role that can wit her way out of any situation. Right. You don't want her to, to necessarily call in her mom or even Sherlock Holmes himself for help, right? You want them to be there, but you don't like, because what they did in the first movie was pretty great in that... Sherlock Holmes comes in and at the end and solves the case, but then they say, well, yeah, but your little sister did it already. She already told us all of this. She solved it for us. That's a cool moment. And it's, it's you know, it's indicative of character growth. Like you said, in Ola Holmes, she has this kind of through line of becoming more independent and she sees her mother at the end, but her mother basically says, I'm going to be gone now. I've taught you everything I know. You can do it, you know, kind of thing. Maybe we don't see her again necessarily, but I sure as heck would think we would see the Mar the Marquess. Is it the Marquess? It's not the Marquis, because that's a French thing. I predict he will be back. But I also predict there will be a love triangle. At the end of the day, this is still going to be kind of a YA kind of thing. There's always a love triangle. There's always a love triangle. So, you know, who the third vertice will be, who's to say? But Look, can I uh, just say, I know love triangles are kind of like this trope that are overplayed and looked down on. But damn, if I'm not a sucker for a good love oh, triangle. Oh, they're fine. They're fine. I'm, I'm not against it. I'm also, I'm not like for it either. I don't, I, I really feel nothing about love triangles. What I do want the is love a love octagon. No, <laughs> that would be, <laughs> boy, that would be, that would be interesting. But uh, no, I want to see a strong villain because when I think back to Enola Holmes, I barely remember who the villain was. And, and, and granted that was because of the way the mystery played out and who, who the villain ultimately wound up being. And she had kind of like this henchman guy who I think was pretty menacing. But I, I want to see some, like, in the Sherlock Holmes universe, you have Professor Moriarty, who is like, Sherlock Holmes is kind of doing his thing for a while, just solving mysteries without even trying, kind of doing that whole Sherlock Holmes thing. And then he meets his intellectual match in this in this professor, right? And I'm not saying that this villain has to be, quote unquote, an intellectual match for Enola Holmes, but 
he or she is going to have to act as a as a suitable foil in some way. I mean, we we've seen this problem so many times in Marvel movies, right? Where the villains are made out of out of cardboard, and so they don't feel like they work. And I think that's going to be critical to to driving this thing. And I don't I haven't read the books, of course, so I don't know. I don't, I don't even know if they can involve someone like Professor Moriarty, given that he's as tertiary to this universe as Sherlock Holmes is, probably. And it might undercut Sherlock Holmes a little bit too much for Enola Holmes to defeat moriarty in a battle of wits but you know i want someone who you know if they're going to take this anola holmes thing and run it for a while maybe a multi-movie villain maybe someone who's pulling the strings in a moriarty way from behind the curtain yeah basically you want something a little bit more compelling than a standard scooby-doo mystery yeah (laughs) i just you know that that felt a little scooby-doo-ish i mean it worked really well but it felt a little scooby-doo-ish it was surprising I, I, I can give it that credit, certainly. It was surprising. I didn't see it coming. And that's, you know, the earmark of a good mystery, right? But I also remember perhaps audibly saying, oh, come on. Because, <laughs> I don't know, it just kind of kind of took the wind out of the sails a little bit. So we'll see what Enola Holmes 2 has in terms of a strong villains. But it sounds like we are all on board. So I do not think it's going to be tied to anything in the first. I think she's going to take a case and that's going to lead her down that path. Do you think she's going to take like taking a case? So that's a, that's a that's a whole other thing entirely because she doesn't really take a case in the first one either. She does though. Remember, she's the uh, representative for the great Sherlock Holmes, and she'll so she'll oh, take a, well, she could take okay. a case under the same veil of being quote unquote Sherlock Holmes person. I feel like it'll be more that she stumbles into a case, kind of yeah. like she did in the first movie, like. I think we'll see her try to start to adapt and build her own new life and then stumble into some mystery that she has to solve. I predict the end of the movie will be, the end of the second movie will be, okay, now I'm open for business, so to speak. But I think the second movie is going to be, she stumbles into some case, solves it, and that's what gives her this idea that like, okay, it wasn't just a one-off. I can do this like as a thing. So now I'm going to do that. But we'll see. We, we want to know what you think on the, on the Twitter sphere. If you've seen Enola Holmes, even if you haven't, what do you want out of this character? What do you want out of this story arc? And are you excited about it? I guess is another question. Should we move into what are you up to Wednesday? Is it time? I'm good here. Have we been up to anything? Tactic, I'll let you start. Would you like to start? Sure, I could start. Take us to Tactic Town. Take us on a train to Tactic Town. The biggest what are you up to Wednesday for this past week is we watched a fun, I guess you would call it teen fantasy? Or what would you what would you call it? We watched the a movie Spontaneous. sci-fi YA rom-com, rom-com drum. We lots watched, of lots of different adjectives. Yeah, we, we watched the movie Spontaneous and we thought it was just going to be funny and it was like existential crisis-y, depressing-y, but not that funny. Anyway, I don't really recommend it, honestly. It was just kind of okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Wow. Can you give a little bit of a synopsis? It was basically uh, a high school class is randomly having students blow up like guts and and all just like... Oh, like like spontaneous combustion. Spontaneous. Yeah. Just spontaneously exploding and they don't know why. Boy, what a weird premise. And it kind of ties... After seeing the way that the world has responded to a global pandemic... I'm just sitting there going, what is the CDC doing here? You know, like, they're just making all the wrong decisions. And, right. and it ended basically with, and I'm sorry if I'm spoiling this with, eh, we don't really know why, but you guys have been dealing with this for long enough. Go live your lives. You guys graduated. J- just go. And that's how what it about their, like What about their dead friends? And yeah, just, dead. Just, 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 just move on. Yeah. They, all, they all had their existential crisis about you know their dead friends or, or their inevitable death. But then they, then they just moved on. And that was it. Do you think the spontaneous combustion... I don't have a horse in this race. I haven't watched this movie. Do you think the spontaneous combustion is a metaphor for something deeper? Like, don't we all spontaneously combust at some point in our teenage lives? I <laughs> can kind of weigh in a little bit. And I don't okay. know if that was necessarily the metaphor they were going for. It was almost like they wanted the introspection of life is very short and unexpected and anything can happen at any time. And how do you deal with that? What do you do with your life knowing that? And I I know the movie was made in, I want to say 2019, so it was definitely pre any of this all happening. But kind of like Tectic said, I feel like maybe in another year, in another era, this movie would have hit a little bit differently, but it was just probably not the right movie to watch now. Mm. Well, good tip. 
I'll be sure to avoid it wherever it's streaming. I will say the trailer made it seem a lot funnier than it was. So also watch out for that. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about a movie that wasn't funny either. Tactic, I don't Trailers want to be dangerous. Should I keep the sad cinema train rolling? Yeah, sure. So guys, this movie won Best Picture this year, which kind of an invitation for sadness typically when you think about the academy nomadland so nomadland is this movie starring francis mcnormand and directed by chloe zhao uh, who also won best director and i think best screenplay this movie won a bunch of awards what it is about is this lady is forced out of her town which is basically a town that was set up in empire nevada which is a real it was a real place basically it's like the premise of this movie is kind of like based on true events there was this mining town in nevada called empire that i think in the year 2011 or something the mine was shut down and the, the town that was basically built around the mine and surrounded the mine and the people lived who worked at the mine was essentially like discontinued as a town right and her husband died i don't remember how it didn't happen in the movie she was alone by the time the movie started but the zip code like they got rid of the zip code like the town just went kaput so she started hashtag van life just kind of like she bought a van and was kind of living this nomadic lifestyle where she would do seasonal work go work at amazon for a little bit go work like harvesting beets in iowa for a little bit and as she goes around the country she meets these people and has conversations with them and builds connections and you know struggles in the way that you expect that you would living a nomadic life it was as uh, as not fun to watch as it sounds. It was very depressing. It was like very much like, oh man, remember the 2008 financial crisis that you forgot about? It happened big time and it ruined people's lives. Like it was just like, it was a lot of that. It was filmed, the Academy is a tough thing because I like the Oscars. Um, I like being able to watch a movie that I know has been awarded for, for various technical reasons, but sometimes Academy award winners and in particular best picture winners, they have this kind of way of insisting on themselves, right? Being maybe a little bit too artsy, being a little too understated. I watched Parasite last year, loved it. I've actually seen it twice. Uh, this, that is not an example of this phenomenon, but Nomadland was just like, there wasn't much of a narrative it was just kind of sad. It was filmed like a documentary. And in fact, a lot of the people who were in the movie were actually nomadic people living in, you know, vans and RVs. And they didn't even, they thought they were being filmed for a documentary. Uh, so that was kind of cool. It was, it was unique in that sense, but it wasn't fun to watch. It is free on Hulu. That's like, that's the strongest recommendation I can give is it's free on Hulu. It won best picture. If you're a film, I'm not even going to say critic. If you're a film snob, you might get something out of it. I don't want to say I got nothing out of it, but it wasn't it wasn't fun and there wasn't really much of a story. And when I show up to movies, I show up for story more times than not, which is why I very often don't really get down with like art house movies. Sounds like a blast. Sounds like yeah, something this, I might stay away from right now. This, this is fun so far. Nerd Bomber, p- pick us up. <laughs> We're, we both just said, hey, there's these movies on the internet that aren't good. So I'll give you, I'll start with my game update. I finished The Call of the Sea And it got more puzzly than the last time I updated you guys on the game. There were a few puzzles that I thought I almost like tapped out and looked stuff up because they went on too long. And I just I was like, oh, there's too many parts to finding the answer to this puzzle. This is not being rewarding and fun. Now this is just getting too long. But the overall story, I think I saw where the story was going about halfway through the game. But the actual ending and... There's a pinnacle decision that you need to make at the end of the game that I thought was pretty rewarding. And overall, for like a five to six hour experience, I think it was pretty fun, really well done. The storytelling, the voice acting was fantastic. The graphic design of the game was a lot of like cell shading art style, really enjoyed that style. It it felt very like Firewatchy in terms of the art style of the game. And you know, I'm a sucker for a good Firewatch like game. Yeah. Like I said, I could probably have done a little bit without as much of the intensive puzzling, but I was still able to figure everything out. So use that as you may. And Illegal, you will be excited to know that this is coming to PlayStation now. It yeah, was a this. timed exclusive. So eventually you'll have to get your hands on it because I think it's it's a compelling enough story that I think you would enjoy it. And the puzzles are probably right up your alley as well. It definitely sounds sounds up my street, no doubt. Uh, you just recommended it to me, which means I can never play it, um, <laughs> which is unfor- unfortunate. But yeah, I'll, I'll check it out for sure. So I'll follow that up with a little bit more of a fun 
television slash movie update. This is more television than it is movie, I guess. I started watching Bridgerton. Oh, gosh. <laughs> My fiance watched all of Bridgerton. I know I know the deal. It's wild, man. Yeah. Is like, that with the bear? No, it, it feels a lot like Downton Abbey almost, but like it's modernized. Like, it's like sexy it's, downtown Abbey. Yeah. Am I thinking Paddington? I'm thinking Paddington. <laughs> yeah, no. This is, this this is, is Bridgerton. not that. <laughs> this is like... I think I watched one scene, and yeah, if you're listening with your kids, turn your volume down for a second. I think I watched one scene in the room with my fiance, and it was like that really hot guy who everyone likes talking to some girl about masturbation, but doing it in like an old English way, like you would like if you were like living in like Regency times. (laughs) And I was like, what the hell? And I just just like left the room. So that's, and sorry, spoilers, I guess. Uh, At some point, he's going to talk about choking the chicken. He doesn't call it that, but... I just want to let you guys know, she watches this when I'm not home. Yeah, this is like, (laughs) these are like my bike rides when I'm on my lunch and I have an hour to ride my bike and I need to fill the time because, you know, I need to fill the time. It's when I watch normal people and that's when I'm watching Bridgerton. I mean, the first episode, I was like, okay, this is not for me. I spent probably like the first three quarters of the first episode thinking, I don't know when this is going to get good, but if it doesn't get good soon, I'm going to DNF this and never watch it again. And then somehow I found myself like getting into it and I'm not really sure what happened. Like, I think they dropped a little bit more of the expositional charade because they do a lot of setting up. Charade. It's yeah, like, it's mean, like Regency. It's like a Regency, like Dear Abby situation, right? Like it's like a gossip columnist lady or something. Uh, yeah, there, essentially, there's there's a gossip columnist. I would almost say it's more like Gossip Girl, but set in old timey time. Boy, what a draw! Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? I got sucked into Gossip Girl too. So I, I may be super nerdy, but there is there is that weirdly girly part of me that likes this kind of stuff. I guess so. You should have you should have asked me. I I could have given you the patent pending patent pended it's pended it's already been patented the best workout show ever it's it's runtime 40 42 minutes it'll fill your hour the west wing it's that's a workout show if you ever if you get sick of bridgerton if you dnf that the west wing i'm gonna i'm gonna See, toss my hat in the ring i'll give you a recommendation to ignore the west wing i'm in this weird limbo i've seen a lot of the west wing before Actually, in my government class in high school, my teacher heavily leaned on watching The West Wing. So I've seen a lot of it. Great teacher. But I started watching it with Tactic, and then he tapped out after the first season. And I don't know if we're ever going to go back to it together. So I feel weird moving on. Wait a second. Did you finish the first season? Yeah, we finished the first season. We were like in the second season. And then he was just like, I need something lighter. Did you tap out when the president got shot? I thought you meant you finished the first season and we're like, whatever. <laughs> I don't care what happens to him. <laughs> like, no, oh we like, I don't remember what exactly happened. I think like political climate stuff popped up and we're like, let's watch a sitcom. So, yeah, I, I, I make, it's, it's not the lightest thing in the world, I suppose. I understand that. That makes sense. And then my final wraparound. I know I'm updating a lot, but we started rewatching New Girl. And there's really nothing new to report except that show is fantastic. And... It's fun. There we go. Still haven't watched it yet. Are you kidding? How I Met Your Mother and now New Girl? Come on, Illegal. You gotta watch these. These days, rewatches are fun because in uh, typical dad fashion, I could just fall asleep on the couch while while the TV's on. I'm too busy watching West Wing. And let me tell you, I also put West Wing on in bed sometimes. I fall asleep to that. But I only, I only do it to episode Fall asleep scene. to the, the sweet, sweet sounds of Martin Sheen. I just gotta get oh. me a lazy boy. You know, the Guys. standard... Martin Sheen. Can we get Martin Sheen on the podcast? Like that should be, let's set that goal for ourselves. If we get Martin Sheen on the podcast, we'll know that we've made it. Everyone, please start like one of those petition things and petition Martin Sheen to come on our podcast. Is he on Twitter? Because like I will tweet, as God is my witness, I will tweet at him and be like, hey man. You know what? I'm going to check this right now. Because like I could talk to him about the West Wing. I could talk to him about the Dead Zone apocalypse now you can you, play mass effect you, and talk well, to him you, about that i would just talk let you talk to him about that i don't think he he is not on the the twitters sorry he's i mean he's like dude's like 80 by now I, I would think so it doesn't surprise me too much martin if you're out there or martin's agent or martin's publicist if you're out there we are in the market for some sheenification over here on the podcast so let's talk about endangered species how about that as, as a segue 
talking about Martin Sheen and jumping to endangered species. The quiz today is about endangered species. And if you were thinking just now, wow, that's not going to be fun, you would be right about that. Look, there's no way to make endangered species happy. I'm going to try my darndest because that's what we do here. But before we do that, let's take a look at the big board. Take a look at the, at the records. Who is atop the rankings? Technic, you want to field that question? No, Top I can tell you points. I'm at the bottom. I'm, 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 I'm a strong foundation. Technic is four and four. Nerd Bomber six and two. And Illegal 86, yours truly, seven and two. I, last, last week, I, I won in the Tournament of Champions. I earned the right to host this week. But we're going to keep the record going for the entire year, as you know. And at the end of the year the winner to, to the victor goes the spoils and the spoils are, are are tbd we'll have to get back to you on that but endangered species so i have a web page in front of me it was i actually found it surprisingly challenging to find a lot of information about endangered species that was not confusing to my small brain so i went to a website called petpedia.com i don't know why petpedia i know pets are animals but like i don't think we're talking about pets here really but they have some facts about endangered species. So we're, we're just kind of going to go. We're going to free ball it. I don't even know how many questions we're going to do. We're going to go until we we feel satisfied. But of course, the first question is the one that you saw coming. The IUCN red list is what is often used. It's, it's a study that's done every year to determine how many species are threatened with extinction. That's the, that's the term that they use. How many species, according to the 2021 report, are threatened with extinction? And Nerd Bomber, I'm going to let you start so we can give Tactic a little bit of a leg up here. I'm going to say 500. Now I'm going to look like a jerk because I was going to say that. I'm going to go a little bit higher because the world's a terrible, terrible place. So I'm going to go 672. The world is a terrible, terrible, terrible place. Technic gets the point. Neither of you were even close. 30,178 species. Guys, I learned a lot. There are over 2 million species that have been recorded. So it's not that bad. But that's still bad. Yeah, it's not great. We're talking about an entire eradication of a species. Yeah, well, so so threatened with extinction, my understanding is that it might have a bit of a broad definition, but consider it in the orange zone. might not be the red zone necessarily, but it also includes the species that are in the red zone. Uh, let's, let's keep rolling. How many, according to Petpedia.com, again, how many animals are killed by hunters for trophies each year? So not species, but like... This is just straight total up animals. animals. Just total animals. It's supposed to drive home the fact that people suck. That's going to that's gonna be an overarching theme of this quiz. 2.5 million. I feel like that's too high. I know it's a lot, but I feel like that's too high. I'm going to say 1,500. I feel like that's too low, but I'd rather lowball it. Lowball it you did, but your strategy was sound. 200,000 animals. It actually says over 200,000, but I assume... But I'm not. right. Well, I don't... It's not how it works. So... That puts us at a at a tie right now. Two questions in. We have many more here. Don't worry about it. In the previous 250 years, how many species have been confirmed extinct? You said 250 years? 250 years. I feel like this is also a really depressing number. I'm going to go with my other answer and say 500. I think it's more than that. I'm going to say 1,000. It was more than that, but not that much more. 571. Uh, so, Nurbomer, you were awfully close. So That uh, was yeah. really close. Again, though, very depressing. Well, if you think that was depressing. Did that include the long-horned ox? I don't have that, I don't have that information in front of me. Okay. I can tell you it does include the dodo bird, uh, but that's really all I can that tell That was within you. the last 200 years? 1690. Actually, so you're right. That was, that was more than 250 years ago. Uh, I just happen to have that stat in front of me as well. It's not a quiz question. Here's one that is, though. We all know about Taz. You know, like the Looney Tunes character, the Tasmanian devil? Well, the Tasmanian devil is slowly disappearing. In 1996... What? Scientists detected a contagious type of cancer that severely damaged the number of the mar- of these marsupials. In the past two and a half decades, what percentage of the Tasmanian devil population has been extinctified, is the word we'll use, as a result of this contagious type of cancer? All right. First and foremost, a contagious cancer is yeah, absolutely horrible. terrifying. It's the worst. At, like, like, from a holistic standpoint, terrifying. I didn't know that cancers can be contagious. Secondly... I'm going to say it's, it's how, what percentage was eradicated or what percentage is eradicated. left? Eradicated. I'm going to say 37%. I'm going to say less than that. Maybe I'm a little bit more optimistic. I'm going to say 10%. We're tied again. 90% <laughs> of 
Uh, things what? aren't looking good. Things aren't looking good for the Tasmanian devil. Why don't they I'm wear not, a mask? I'm not trying to make light of that at all, but that's just, that's, that's where we are. Okay. Uh, well, we're into question five. You know what? Actually, what we're going to do, we're going to do six questions in a tiebreaker because the tiebreaker, I'm trying to think. There's one question I really want to do, but I want it to be a text in question. So why don't, this is depressing. So why don't we go ahead and do that? Make this fifth question the final question for all the marbles. It's a text in question. No first steps, no any of that nonsense. Just straight up, you have to give me the answer. Okay. How many tigers are there in the entire world? That's it. That's the question. Which, speaking of that, I'll, I'll, I'll pile on here to the sadness. Tiger King, Joe, Joe Maldonado Passage, Joe Exotic. Apparently he has prostate cancer. I, re- I was reading about that today. Mm. Yeah. Tough break. Boy, Tactic. Tactic, are you drunk over there? He's not answering. Well, I spoke too soon. He went into Ta- a stupor. Tactic takes it. No. Uh, why? Seriously? Because I knew it was right. Uh, Did you Google it? No. Are you over there Googling it? No. Nerbomer, What's on your phone Nerbomer, screen right now? Relax. He wasn't even close. You just went over. Oh. Um, <laughs> you actually got... Nerbomer, I'll give you half a point uh, because you got exactly double the actual no. number. No. No, uh, that's half a point nonsense. Well, you still win. 3,900 is the answer. Again, <laughs> just according wait to Pet, see, Wait until you hear my answer. Did yeah, you say te- one? Tactic came in with 17. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what? And which like... Joe Exotic owned more than 17 tigers at one point, I'm pretty sure. So uh, That's what I was counting on, like, I don't know. I was counting on there being more tigers in the world. You're counting on a lot of kooks owning tigers? Wait, so how uh, many are there? 3,900. So, uh, guys, I don't know what to say here. Recycle. Uh, if, you, if you know anyone who hunts for trophies, tell them to stop. I don't... Like, I don't what, do we do? what can we do, right? And not not to pile onto the depression, but what what can we do as 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 citizens besides raise awareness about endangered species, which I guess is what we're doing right now? Hug an animal. Hug a tiger. You know what? Hug a tiger. I'm gonna hug both of my of my animals right after this is over, and I encourage you to do the same if you're an animal owner or lover. But in the meantime, we thank you for joining us so much on this fantastic episode of Online Warriors. I'm Lee Eighty Six uh, for myself and Nerd Bomber and Tactic. We wish you all a happy and healthy week and go forth and tell your, okay, you know how they have gas, you know how they have gas station attendants and those guys don't really do anything anymore because no one, like everyone pumps their own gas, go inside and tell them like, you know how that like you go into the gas station and like you, you walk up and they have like, nowadays they have that big plastic shield. Although some places always had the plastic shield. They're right behind that big plastic shield buy like a pack of gum or something and while you're doing that just say hey you know you're sitting back there whiling away the hours you could be listening to a podcast where they talk about laundry for the first six minutes <laughs> <laughs> and, and i'm sure they'd be like hey thanks so tell your gas station attendant tell your barista i think we might have done barista already but tell them again what, what do you have to lose they're your barista they're gonna keep serving you and have a great week Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night. My name is Thomas, and what's your name? Uh, I'm Alan. Alan. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We're brothers. That's right. Yeah, yeah brother, that. mother, same mother and father. Your room was. Oh, we shared a room. Shared a room. For we us? shared a room. I thought I knew your face. Yeah, we go we? way back, mate. Yeah. yeah. We should do a podcast then. Uh, we have. We do. We do a podcast. We do a podcast. What's it called? The Brocast. Yeah, that was planned. Yeah, yeah. Well, what do we do? Well, we cover all different things in the world of pop culture. We're talking about comic books, we're talking about professional wrestling, and we're talking about movies. Go back and watch classic retro wrestling events, the likes of WWE, WCW, and if you do like that, you can check us out on Apple iTunes, also on Podbean, Anchor, and on Podknife. Also, check us out on Twitter, at The Broadcast. That's B-R-O. K-A-S-T. Hey, hey, the ending. Hey, it's all right. Good on you. Yeah. Instagram also at the Broadcast Podcast. Remember, we don't spell it with a C. We spell it with a K. Slowly, mate. Take it easy.